Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is the acclaimed German writer, Matthias Politiki, and here he is in person. Thank you, Matthias, for coming all the way to Berlin today to be with us here on Talking Germany. Thank you Wonderful. for inviting me. Great stuff. Now, uh, Matthias Politiki is a globe-trotting author of essays, poems and novels, including his latest, Samarkand, Samarkand, which is, I suppose, a dark exploration of the clash of cultures. He's also a bit of a controversialist and has got involved in some of the big public debates here in Germany in recent years. And best of all, he's very entertaining. So plenty to look forward to. Yeah. You're smiling a little bit <laughs> about that introduction. I would like to welcome you here today as a representative of German literature, yeah? Because German literature is deep, boring and plotless. <laughs> I know that, yeah. It's your quote, yeah? <laughs> yeah, um, that's what happened to me when, when I had my first reading in London. Um, the, my, my counterpart open to the public. We know German literature. And I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, that's what the British think uh. of us. And then she said, well, but there is something like Matthias Politiki as well. And so I was happy to have her at my side. But um, yeah, I learned a lot about uh, how English look towards the Germans mm -hmm. in those days and especially to German literature. And sometimes they are right. It is Sometimes they're right. Well, I mean, you yourself, you once started a campaign for something that you called New German Readability. Yes. What was that all about? Well, so maybe it was a kind of an English idea of... of it, it, it has to be fun to read. It, it, it doesn't only... Sh it, it shouldn't only be work reading a book. So after having mm -hmm. accomplished and done, uh, you could uh, relieve and say, it was a great book. I've read it. This is maybe uh, the type of literature I uh, thought was a bit outdated in, yeah. in, in our days. I, I don't like all these light stuff, but I think you... If you, you don't like the light stuff? Well, uh, <laughs> either. Uh, I think good literature is always both. It has to have a deep, solemn ground, mm -hmm. but to, to, well, to be a pleasure being read. It's interesting because the, the backdrop to what you're saying is the fact that here in Germany and more than in any other country I know, there's a big divide between serious culture mm. and entertainment. It's a very big divide. Where does that come from? I don't know. I'm not old enough to know. But uh, <laughs> I've grown up with that. It, it's called E-literature for yeah. ernst, ernst, serious. serious. That's where you furrow and your you brow. Know, yeah. Unterhaltsam. Yeah. So Entertainment. Family, uh, sometimes. And I, I proclaimed uh, in another essay, we need EU literature, which is, well, of course, European as well, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. which yeah. is the second aspect of, of, of my idea of literature, this cosmopolitan uh, attempt. Uh, but um, this is where I still stand now, uh, mm -hmm. EU that's uh, the that's clue to yeah. the heart of a reader. OK. But tell me, sort of, what shape is German literature in at the moment? Because I, what happens with me very often is that I'll go to the US or I'll go to the UK or wherever and I'll say to people, what should I be reading? What's interesting? Mm. And people will say, have you got a piece of paper and a pen? And we'll make a list. Yeah? And they'll tell me about all things. I'll go out and buy the books and I'll read them. When I say to people here in Germany, I've got friends outside Germany who are interested or would be or could be interested in new German literature. What can you recommend? They sort of go, hmm, tough question. Well, at least I, uh, I don't, well, I could start recommending, but <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know if it's a <laughs> topic now. Um, uh, but just think about Jens Sparschuh, who is uh, my age, or mm -hmm. our age, uh, mm -hmm. somewhere in between. And um, he's a, an East German writer, yeah. a brilliant writer. He studied philosophy in, in the old, uh, well, DDR, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, lived in Moscow, or no, Petersburg, I think, for a while. And, uh, well, she, she, yeah. Uh, he, he writes brilliant novels, for example, very funny, mm -hmm. uh, but always with this um, serious um, interior... OK. Th th that's interesting. Carnal. I'm very, very grateful for that. We had here on the show, we had Egon Ruger, who was uh, also who came from the East, grew up in the East and, ah. and wrote about very, very a brilliant book about, about the East. And, and the guy you're recommending, tell me his name again and tell me for the viewers as well. Jens Sparschuh. And Sparschuh. especially uh, Der Zimmerspringbrunnen. 
That's one of, of his famous uh, books. Okay. A bestseller. Okay. Yeah, we'll have you, to look out you will for that. Well, one for me to look out for. You've put me, you've, yeah. you've put me right on where on the, getting more enthusiastic about new German literature. <laughs>My mother was the same type. Um, once I remember when I was a very little child, I couldn't read it in the, those days, uh, uh, but she read every day, was lying on the sofa, reading, 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 and once she forgot to cook uh, lunch. And I went down and I looked at her and thought to myself, wow, that must be fascinating. She must be hungry like I am, but and I didn't dare to interrupt. I still remember that. that is, so that is really interesting. You remember my, my own mother. It was very interesting because we get sort of a real working class household, and she would do whatever needed to be done until sort of ten or eleven o'clock in the evening, and then she would go upstairs in one of these you know English sort of upstairs downstairs mm. houses, and she would and she would say, "I'm going upstairs to read now." Yeah, and it sounded like the most important moment of the day for her. Yeah, yeah. but nowadays, of course, it's part of the work. To read what yeah. others have written, to read for, well, for research, for, for a, a novel and yeah. so on. It's a completely different way of reading. That's why I think I, I wrote this sentence. Okay. Uh, I, understood, I understand that you actually began writing to try and win a girl's heart. That's true. <laughs> and I, I didn't win it. You didn't I couldn't, win I couldn't, it. I couldn't. Nobody could. But um, <laughs> as we all start, no, not all, but few of us started and, and, well, it was a good time, even though the girls stayed apart. It was a, a men's club, 16 mm -hmm. year old men <laughs> in the woods outside of Munich um, reading poems to each other. Uh -huh. It sounds like a, like a bad uh, a B movie, yeah. but that is my youth. And um, I started to discuss poems in that. It was great. Of course, sometimes somebody had grabbed a bottle of wine from his father, and we sat there half night long and um, looked at the sky Wonderful. and discussed about poems. With Wonderful. Lovely memories. So, <laughs> talking of girls, let's talk about women, because one of your, your breakthrough novel, we just heard about it, was called Viber Roman, woman's novel. It hasn't, really, it hasn't been translated. It, it was a real bestseller. It was about a guy called Gregor Schattschneider. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Fascinating name. He's an I think it's fair to say an everyman, somebody who sort of represents his own generation. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of you in it, yeah? So I'd like to ask you... Are you really? Uh, yeah. Joking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Are you a typical product of your generation? Oh, yes, I am. Um, uh, as we call it, the 78ers. Mm -hmm. uh, We've had the 68ers in Germany, you're a 78 the, These are the, the mm -hmm. more representative, maybe... Uh, for if you look from from other countries towards Germany, the 1680s were more relevant. Maybe that's that's part of the problem already. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we had a very long but golden youth. Pff, well, nothing really had to be done. Mm -hmm. The job was already done by the elder. Um, so um, we had a lot of time to well to. to To read to poetry. Read, <laughs> to, to, yet, uh, and I think uh, in the long run, uh, that was necessary to produce a new type of literature. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we write completely different books than the uh, elder generations. Mm -hmm. um, other topics, other style, other sound, other rhythm. Um, and uh, still we lack uh, uh, the, 
the uh, ornament of our generation or the uh, single movement as in Paris 68 or Berlin and Frankfurt, uh, we don't have that. And okay. maybe that is part of the definition already. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, your more recently, you've re you, you wrote and you, you, you published a novel which was called The Next World Novella. We've got, it, we've got it here, and it's got a very, very good English translation. It's a very intriguing book. Um, it's about a man who is an unremarkable man who has a remarkable wife. What does that tell us about men and women? If you're lucky, <laughs> you could be this man. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I hope it, uh, it's just uh, a novel and doesn't tell anything about <laughs> you or my uh, uh, life uh, because it all ends not only, uh, it begins with the death of his wife, but it, uh, it's getting worse and mm -hmm. worse, uh, turning the pages. So um, let's keep it a literary character okay. and uh, well I, I had a lot of readings and a lot of readers write to me that ah, they stopped uh, talk to each other uh, uh, being married means in the long run to not to stop talking I think that's the the, the, the main thing you do when you are married. Or, there are some more interesting or more fascinating aspects of being married, but uh, talking to each other or in the long run stopping to talk mm -hmm. tells a lot about the relation. And this is what readers write to me because that's of course the tragedy of this couple as well. Matthias, as we discovered in that report, it, the, the novel took you 25 years to write. Why, why did it take that long? I couldn't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I, I started again and again. Sometimes uh, I was lucky till page number 100. Yeah. Some other attempts ended earlier. Um, but in um, 1987, I was an experimental author, as we call it. Mm. An author who plays with words and the colours of the vowels was uh, the topic of this first novel in 1987. And you can picture me worrying about the, well, the sounds and the, the colours of the vowels. This is not really the... The plot that um, it's not what makes, came out at the end. It's not uh, the book <laughs> no. that uh, is uh, was really uh, a th kind of a thriller that I, I wanted to write, mm. and I discovered that it's much easier to to write in an experimental way to present all the all what you can do with language than just to uh, concentrate on the plot and mm. serve the reader. I think we are kind of uh, like. Not, not servants, but we are. We, without readers, we are nothing. It's not the author who writes only for himself or for other authors. No, we write for readers. Mm. So we have to to concentrate. Okay, you you write for readers. It's uh, the book. The book has been described by one critic as Politiki's vision of the end of the West. That sounds very dramatic and very pessimistic. Is it, is it true? Yeah, you, you know how critics write. <laughs> uh, of course, they want to grab the reader as well, yeah, sure. <laughs> as I want with the book. No, it's a critical moment in uh, Western history. And, um, uh, yeah, but still there's Kaufner, uh, the main character, trying to uh, fulfil the mission. And uh, on the very last page, we don't know if he was able to or mm. not. I don't want to... <laughs> you're, you're, to really you're, you're talk being about very that. cautious. You don't want to reveal too much. But um, it's still open. Yeah. It's still open. Symbolism is very important, as we saw in the report. You see, you've, you've got Russian propaganda coming from the mosque. You've got you've got the muezzin calling the faithful to prayer from a Hamburg church tower. It's about the twin towers being destroyed, which was a symbolic act as mm. as much as anything mm. else. Why is that symbolism so important? 
um, to us as being Europeans and um, after enlightenment, of, we, we tend to uh, uh, discuss everything with our well, intellectual uh, way of interpreting mm -hmm. uh, the facts and the others. But uh, traveling uh, outside this cosmos of enlightenment, uh, you soon get to know that other uh, mentalities not only concentrate on intellectualism. They, what happened uh, when World Trade Center was attacked, I was shocked that it's a criminal act, it's terrorism. Yeah. But to lots of people, we saw them dancing in the street by our TV, it was a symbolic uh, uh, action uh, in the holy war. Mm. To me, that's uh, still a crime. But picture them being, being uh, well, being not being uh, uh, in in uh, or being part of a conflict that is dominated by the West. If you talk about uh, the Gaza uh, Gaza people or. Afghanistan or whomever, and that's the last idea they have to attack uh, the West via symbolic acts to at least have symbolic victories. It's still a crime, but it could happen to a declining Western rest of uh, uh, Europe as well if no other means is there to grab if, if you're helpless. Your protagonist, Alexander Kovner, how much of you, you did a lot of research. Research is very, very important to you. When, when you were there in Uzbekistan, we saw you in the report. What did you learn about Uzbekistan? What did you learn about the people? Oh, there are hundreds of people living there in one country. I learned that it's not only, let's say, Central Asians. No, it's Tajik, it's Uzbek, it's Kyrgyz, it's Russians, it's, it's uh, from Iran, from, from everywhere. It's a melting pot. Mm. And we could picture them as being multiculti, part of the new global world, but the truth is the very opposite. Mm. They are just living one aside the other. There's a village of the Turks, the next village is Tajik, in the big cities, of course. But they the problems start already. Mm. And it made me nervous as I was raised with multicultural ideas and I still mm. stick to them, but I had to learn it's not that easy. Mm. Uh, Although in, there in is, of course, a really big debate here in Germany about multiculturalism, about you know whether, to, to what extent, multi, the multicultural society is working in Germany or is not working here. We'll talk about that in just a second. Yeah? <laughs> I know this is something that you've given quite a lot of thought about to religion, culture and the role it plays. And I, want, and I just wonder what you can tell me about how important or not the church is these days in Germany. Well, I just think, think of our history, uh, the division between the North and the South, the Catholic South and the Protestant North. So you get Germany in a nutshell. It's not East and West, as we always think. No, it's the North and the South. It's a very, very important, important uh, point uh, you're making. If you want to understand Germany, you need to understand that North-South Yeah, divide, and I'm a Southerner. Really just, I was southern, raised in Munich yeah. and I, I fell in love with a woman uh, living in Hamburg, so I mm. changed places. But that was more than changing the places. It's, it's a complete new... <laughs> the jacket and, and the coat and the house and everything and, and, and the sound of the city is different. Yeah. Uh, Protestantism is, is something else, even though I'm a Protestant <laughs> uh, in, from Munich, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, when I was on research for our next no world novella, yeah. I needed a church in Berlin who rang the bells every hour or I would have uh, preferred every quarter of an hour. Mm -hmm. And it took me weeks and months of research because they don't ring the bells any longer because all, and this is typical for the, the role of religion in, in our Christian society, that nobody who lived there wanted the church to ring the bells. It was just noise to them. But can you picture a, a vibrant religion called Catholicism or Protestantism without ringing the bells every now and then. 
It's, it's interesting when you use the word there, vibrant religion. You talk about people, the bells no longer ringing. People, we've just heard from the report, are leaving the churches here in mm. Germany in droves, it's often said. Uh, do you... I, I got the feeling from Samarkand, Samarkand, in a way, that you actually possibly envy people who have real religious conviction. In a certain way, I do. As I was raised with Nietzsche, who, as you know, said... Um, God is dead, and so on, and so on, and so on. And um, it's not only uh, that I keep that sentence in mind, but <clears throat> it, from the mind, it came to a bit lower to my heart and to all my bones, and it, now it's in my bones that I, there's no God left for us any longer. And when I go abroad and, and have discussions with imams starting in the in the, uh, the Near East, uh, but with, with Wow, with African voodoo priests and so on, they are so strong in their way of interpreting the world. And I'm always the, the enlightened, tolerant, nice guy from <laughs> the Western world, understanding everything and everybody yeah. and saying, fine, what are you doing? And sometimes I come home and say, to them, wow, they don't think, fine, what you're doing. No, no, it's fine that we do what we do, and you should do that as well. That is something else. Oh, well, it's interesting when you're talking about those, those kind of fault lines between cultures and religions. There was Samuel Huntington, uh, several years ago now, wrote a book about the mm. clash of civilizations, and lots of liberals pounced on him and said that that doesn't describe the world in which we live. But I, I think to an extent, what we're seeing is that cultures are doing that. There's a sort of a confluence of cultures, and cultures learning from each other and overlapping. But at the same time, there is a clash of cultures. Is there not so that's what you describe in your book, in Samarkand, yeah. Samarkand. Yeah. The intellectuals, I think they mingle and they form a new global society, which I, I would love to, uh, well, to be the structure for the whole world, but it's not. If you look uh, some levels uh, more close to where the ground, where, the, where our feet are, not only where our, you, you have to accept that all over in the world there is a, well, a redefinition of, of regional uh, cultures who don't want to belong to this global uh, uh, culture of the whole world. It started in Europe with, with Yugoslavia mm -hmm. and all that. We have Russia and Ukraine nowadays and this will not be the last chapter of, of, of the story. Mm -hmm. I hate that. But on the other side, I have to understand that people don't want to live in abstract visions of, uh, of a, and even if it's a European uh, community, which I really favor. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a, really a European by heart, mm -hmm. but I come across a lot of people who prefer to stay Spanish. This, and even in Germany, they don't want to stay German. Maybe this is a problem, but Bavarian. You once or, said, you once said, I like being German. Yeah. What specifically do you like about being German? Oh, I think we learned our lesson well. Uh, I mean, the historical lesson. Yeah. Uh, I can see it wherever I come across uh, representatives of my generation. We are open-minded. We uh, don't uh, think that we have nothing to do with the black sides of our history. But, uh, uh, and we keep that in mind, but on the other hand, we found back to a more a lighter way of being German. We, we don't go to the cellar if we are in need of laughing. Uh, of course, some days we say, okay, tomorrow we laugh about the joke, but still we stay on ground floor. Uh, so this is a difference. Sometimes, especially in England, people wondered, oh, you're German, and there's so many like me, I think. This is uh, uh, what we are nowadays, uh, Germans, uh, and uh, wherever I come across them. Of course, we hide from each other in the first step, but then it, if we come at ease, it's always good uh, to... Because they, they are, some others are more stubborn in their way. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>Well, Matthias Politik, I mean, call me a snob if you want. Uh, it, it, I, I've never been on a cruise liner and I might never go on one. I'm not sure. Oh, no, I heard I. Give me good reasons to do so. The sea. The sea. That's the only chance that you can live on, in or 
from under the sea, if you, <laughs> and the bottom, very close to the bottom, yeah. uh, for a longer period. Yeah. And uh, of course, you just uh, if you think about all the destinations, it's it's in the long end, it's 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 always too short. Mm -hmm. That's not the reason to go uh, on a cruise uh, uh, cruise ship, but living that close to the sea for several weeks that makes you look differently towards the waves, the kind of blue, greenish, mm -hmm. the atmosphere, the sky changes from, from, from island to island and the approach to the islands is great as well. You oh. cannot travel this by a bus. <laughs> No, you have yeah. to. You have to have a ship. You're beginning to win me over. You're beginning to convince me. Yeah, you were on. You were on board the MS Europa for um, 184 days. Yeah, which is half. How, a year. how did that come about? How, how, you know. Well, it, uh, like all big stories, it, <laughs> you know from from American novels, they start with a telephone call. So um, that happened to me as well, and so. All from a sudden, I was in a in a discussion with Habak Lloyd, uh, mm -hmm. who had the idea of installing uh, the first and the last <laughs> writer in residence <laughs> because it wasn't easy in the long run for yeah. both sides uh, to mm -hmm. survive. Mm -hmm. uh, because writers are well, uh, that's not a typical mm, person who goes on a cruise uh, tour. Mm -hmm. uh, still, I enjoyed it and... Uh, well, uh, let's just have a look at one or two photos okay. of, yeah, of you on the, on the vessel, as it were, yeah? and tell me what we're seeing, tell me what's well, going on. Nothing. It's got <laughs> nothing much there. Yeah, yeah. I was writing every day. I, yeah. I had a blog on this tour, uh -huh. which was the basis base of my then of my novel. Uh, yeah, we were going to an island again in my cabin, uh, working. Yeah, I was working pretty uh, reading mm -hmm. together with uh, with John Manhattan. Who, had a little jazz on it, preparing for dinner time. Uh, in the Looking very smart, smart indeed. Well, sometimes <laughs> uh, even writers have to wear smokings. So, well, I enjoyed even the smoking. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't have a smoking before, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Very good. You did look very, very smart. Did to, yeah, I, from what you're saying, reading between the lines or listening very closely to what you're saying, I have the sense that although you enjoyed looking away from the boat, out to sea, and all the colours and all this kind of thing, <laughs> yeah, what was going on behind you was a little bit alienating, to use a, little, uh, to use a big word. Yeah? yeah, there were great guys on board, no question about that. But these funny types that you picture were there as well. And if they were only aliens, fine. But uh, some of uh, them had problems with me writing about <clears throat> the ship and the tour as a writer does with fantasy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, describing what's not going on on the ship. They thought I was a journalist. <laughs> and, and, and they read the blog as well and they complained the other day and said, what are you doing, man? We are not feeding animals uh, with the diamonds of, of our ladies after dinner uh, uh, to <laughs> prepare the next. Uh, uh, no, what should people think if they read that? And they did read the blog, that mm -hmm. was for sure. And I said, fine, it's, it's a novel, <laughs> keep cool. But <laughs> they had no clue what I meant. So I got big problems with part of the crew uh, there was one captain who, well, who, but the other was um, <laughs> becoming my friend, Yuri. So, so uh -huh. those types exist on, on those boats. When he was the captain, I had, I had great times as well. Okay. So I have a, an ambivalent uh, memory, but it was worth going there. Mm -hmm. And would you say no? If somebody I'm waiting. gives you a call, you're still I'm waiting, waiting huh? for the phone to ring. <laughs> I will Please. fake that once and we're, we're, try we're, what you say. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're running out of time a wee little bit, and you've got you've brought along. We like to ask our guests to bring along a cherished possession. Yeah, let me just have a look. Let's have a look at this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a table marker. It's a table marker. It's not from the boat. No. No, it's from Moshi, oh. uh, which is a little mm. town in Africa, in Tanzania, where I'm just coming from. Mm. And as you see here. It's uh, close to the Kilimanjaro. Oh, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I spent four days in this hotel as I wanted to run the Kilimanjaro Marathon, as what I did. And uh, saying goodbye to everybody, uh, I 
I grabbed it and said, I'd love to have it. And it took me one hour to convince <laughs> them. And they phoned the manager and yeah. the manager came, appeared, an Indian guy. And said, you want that? It's nothing. It's not a real souvenir. And said, but it's more than a souvenir. It's authentic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a symbol of, of, of the hotel and of the whole trip, the Kilimanjaro, the marathon, please. And he gave it to me as a present. As I promised uh, to him, I'll come back and then climb it next time. Now I ran it and next time. Oh, and I drank it as well. That's Kilimanjaro beer uh -huh. as well. That's, and, a, that's good. It's good that you mentioned beer because I was going to move on slowly but surely to our Talking Germany quiz at the end of the show. Ah, I hear the music. You've written a book. It's here. It's only published in German about German and English beer. Yeah? Yeah. I've got to ask you, being English, which is better, German or English beer? Oh, sorry to say, Bavarian. Bavarian beer. Good answer. <laughs> that is your lot with the entertaining Matthias Politiki. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss.